spring of 1482, Leonardo da Vinci wrote a letter to Lodovico Sforza, regent of the Duchy of Milan. Read. Not only that, I am able to build strong bridges that are easy to remove. They can be carried by armies for miles. Called the Moor because of his swarthy complexion, Lodovico presided over one of the richest states in Italy. Also the most northerly, it acted as a buffer to the territorial ambitions of European monarchs. For this reason, Leonardo stressed his abilities as a military engineer. Huh? What's he say? Repeat that. I know a way to destroy bridges. During sieges, I am able to remove water from moats and construct scaling ladders. I can also make a cart so armored no cannon can penetrate it. You can place your men right behind these vehicles so that when they attack, they can be completely protected. I can make a cart so armored. No cannon can penetrate. And then my men behind it can attack. Shall I continue? Hmm. Yes, go on. Yes, Excellency. Now, as to other pursuits, I hope I can be of some service to you regarding the bronze horse that you're constructing for the immortalization of your father's memory and the illustrious house of Sforza. While we do not know the precise reason for Leonardo's departure from Florence, the fact that he stressed his bronze casting over his other artistic abilities indicates that he hoped to get the commission for this Thank often you. discussed, often postponed project of the Milanese rulers. Leonardo was 30 years old and an artist of some note he had known great growth in Florence, but little personal satisfaction and accomplishment. His greatest works were still ahead of him when he arrived in Milan. <laughs> so, you are Leonardo, the man sent to me by Lorenzo de' Medici of Florence. A man who travels all this distance to Milan just to tell me he can build a bridge. That's true. Your letter to me contains many promises. Aren't you exaggerating? Just a bit. I wrote this in there, too. Though to all other men, the matters of which I tell you may seem to be a fool's madness. I beg leave to experiment till I finish them all. <laughs> I must be careful. You Tuscans all have silver tongues. Ah, Cecilia, what should I do? Can the maestro show any proof? But Madonna Cecilia, that's all I want. Cecilia Gallerani was just 16 and the favorite of Lodovico the Moor. He had officially been betrothed to Beatrice d'Este, who happened to be a six-year-old child. Go on, take the dog away. We men have work. <laughs> As he waited for the six-year-old to grow up, Lodovico amused himself with this gentle, intelligent girl who wrote poetry and whose innate sweetness could soften his brutal directness with a smile. In the years to come, a deep and touching friendship was to grow between her and Leonardo. Ah, uh, about your letter, leave it here. We'll think about it. Go and have a look at Milan. It's not Florence, I'll admit, but there's a lot less gossip and a lot more work. Goodbye. After the violent death of Galeazzo Sforza, only his title and honors passed down to his son. His most Christian. The real power resided in his rough but able brother. From the desk in this room, Lodovico the Moor controlled everything in Milan. Milan was a vast and powerful industrial center interlaced with canals. These canals crossed the city in every direction and were used to transport large quantities of merchandise. Water was the life force of the weaving mills, where 60,000 textile workers were employed, producing wool and silk. had always fascinated Leonardo. Not only the city, but the entire countryside was veined with canals which radiated life and vigor to every corner of the spreading plain. A plain Leonardo never forgot. It possessed a soft melancholy, so different from the geometric precision of his native Tuscany. To understand Leonardo, one must understand Lombardy, where he spent 20 of his most industrious years. the sound of the water, saw the mist, the horizon disappearing in fog. He discovered what landscapes were really like, things he had only guessed about previously. In the notes for his projected treatise on painting, he wrote, If you paint objects in the open countryside, 
paint them with an intervening mist so that the borders of light and shadow are never rigid and precise. When you are upon the road as the evening falls, look at the faces of the men and women and see what grace and softness you find there. One sees an exquisite grace, an interplay of light and shadow upon the faces of those who sit on their threshold, heightened by the darkness within the house. Maestro Leonardo! Maestro Leonardo, I've been looking for you all over. Don't you know me? I'm the Predis. I'm Roger the Predis. Ah, oh, yes, yes. Now I recall. The confraternity of the Conception have contracted my brother and me. They want us to paint a triptych for the church of San Francesco Grande. It's for the high altar, and they're paying 800 lire. But I know we can't do it alone, so my brother and I immediately thought of you. You'll paint the panel in the center. They want a Madonna. A virgin in the company of an angel. That is neither man nor woman. An angel that smiles. An angel of joy. After a year in Milan, Leonardo's friendship with the mediocre but enterprising De Pretis brothers brought him his first opportunity. The contract was signed in April 1483 and is still to be found in the archives in Milan. The painting itself, called The Virgin of the Rocks, is now at the Louvre. It represented something revolutionary in painting. For in addition to the conventional methods of perspective used to give depth to a figure, Leonardo added depth to the air itself. He created a new perspective. Another perspective, which I call aerial. The Virgin had a profound effect on Milan and brought Leonardo inside the court at last. You know, dear lady, to work in marble for long periods can mean hard work for an artist. You have to split stone and brush off marble dust, sweating like a pig, but the painter sits at ease, working slowly on his creation in the quiet, magnificently clothed, moving in faint spasms and strokes, his brush dipped in color. And then if he desires, he is accompanied by music. Please, please, please. No, no, quiet, let me through. of invention of Maestro Leonardo. Bravo! <laughs> I didn't know that drum, too. Why do you forget these things when you write us? <laughs> I've always said you're a magician. And this proves it. And the painting? Huh? Your Excellency would like to judge for himself. <laughs> a magician. <laughs> Why isn't she holding the dog instead of that thing? The ermine is the symbol of innocence. Mm. Oh. Leonardo was untiring. He could always find a strange new allegory with which to praise the Moor. But what is it? Uh, this thing in the boat, what is it? A mulberry tree? Exactly. But in Latin, the word is morus. So what about this morus? A moor! A moor. <laughs> As Your Excellency says, a moor with a ship of state in his hands. So <laughs> the court, which was presided over by Lodovico the Moor, was at times very refined, at times extremely common. Lodovico, though he held fantastic banquets for visitors at court and sponsored great spectacles, executed solely by his director, Leonardo da Vinci, also had a vulgarity that couldn't be denied. It's interesting that Leonardo, who had nothing in common with the shallow idlers at court, spent so many years seeking the favors of the powerful. The real Leonardo was revealed in his nightly excursions into the deeply hidden secrets of life and death. Here, the elegant courtier who posed riddles for fine ladies devoted his solitary hours to the study of anatomy. Oh, maestro! Ten corpses. 
cutting through the flesh, so that I might observe and sketch the veins and organs within. If a man wishes to achieve knowledge, love of research is not enough, for he may be prevented by his own physical weakness, his natural repugnance, or he may be stopped by his fear of living through the night in the company of the desecrated dead, cut and flayed beyond recognition. If none of these things stop him, perhaps he will be denied the ability to sketch his findings. The 120 books I plan to fill will testify if I am hampered by any of these things. Why did Leonardo begin his studies of anatomy? At first, it was merely to gain complete knowledge of the bodies he wished to draw or paint. But soon, he was not content with simply copying the various movements of the body. His notes, written in his inverted style, which could only be read when held to a mirror, began to show an intense desire to understand why the body behaved as it did. Why the arm assumed a certain position and not another. And so, he studied not the arm, but the muscles that make the arm move. Up to this point, his research, however profound it may have been, was related to painting. But his thirst to inquire into everything, the passionate desire to know all, drove him to examine the wondrous machinery of the entire human body. Now he no longer sought only to paint its exterior, but to delve into its inner mysteries, its complex structure of veins, nerves, and tissues. Beginning his studies as a painter, he continued them as a scientist, and he carried on this research for the rest of his life. There is little point in marveling at the contribution his treatise on anatomy would have made to contemporary science. For like many of his works, it was never finished. As usual, new fields of interest constantly distracted him, and his probings and discoveries in one area of knowledge inevitably posed a dozen questions in other areas. Thus, in his efforts to give greater depth to the figures in his paintings, he encountered problems connected with what has become known as the science of stereoscopy. Leonardo the artist asked, why do we see in depth? Because each of our two eyes gives us a slightly different image. Each sees the object from another angle, and the merging of the two points of view creates the sensation of depth. The pupil of the eye changes size according to the light or darkness before it. In this manner, nature protects the eye from suffering through too much light, as a man might close one shutter to lessen the amount of bright sunlight entering his house. When the image of an object penetrates a dark room through a small hole, you can see its outline and tone on a piece of white paper. That is how an image forms in the eye. Leonardo was among the first to depict the eye in a way that might suggest the workings of a modern camera. And he experimented with various methods of solidifying the eye by boiling it in the white of an egg to allow dissection, a process still in use. Eventually, he learned that the sensation of light is transmitted to the brain by the optic nerve, he experimented further. Leonardo founded a study on the problems of light. It became known as photometry, which is the science that measures the strength and intensity of light. A stone thrown into the water creates motion. Concentric circles expand outward from the hub of the disturbance. The same motion occurs in the air when a sound disturbs it. It is also true that every luminous body creates motion and fills the surroundings with its image. Due to his probing nature, he had to have answers to everything. But a problem is only one link of a great chain, of a chain that can never be finished. Even the cherished treatise on painting he started was never finished, like so many things. From the treatise, an enormous amount of material has come down to us, but it consists largely of isolated chapters and cryptic notes. Strangely enough, so much of this treatise, ostensibly concerned with painting, seems less devoted to painting than to other subjects which had lately come to occupy his restless mind. We cannot be sure when the next turning point in his life came. Some put it as early as 1483, but more likely it was around 1488, when he had already spent six of his 36 years in Milan.
Duke has decided you may construct the equestrian monument, but it must be done quickly. Cecilia. I begged for this at the beginning, and now the moor is in a hurry. <laughs> the horse, the giant equestrian statue which so many artists had dreamed of and yet dreaded, now belonged to him. The idea of an immense monument to honor Francesco Sforza, founder of the dynasty, had been considered by all of his successors. Although every artist talked about this project, few came forth to attempt it. For this reason, in the letter which Leonardo sent the Moor, he could write very simply, I will build the horse for you. Everyone knew about the famous horse. There would be no more rest now. As usual, Leonardo desired to create the perfect horse of idealized beauty. He carefully observed and sketched each one he came across. In his first version, with the horse rearing, a pose we find in many of his works, he imagined Francesco Sforza striking a fallen foe. But then he decided upon a more tranquil figure, similar to the famous Regisola at Pavia, which, by the way, no longer exists. The Moor was in a hurry. However, he constantly diverted Leonardo with other demands. One major diversion was this dome for the cathedral in Milan. Leonardo worked on a number of drawings on a small model, but eventually lost the contract because his designs were beyond the capabilities of contemporary construction. The Moor continued to assign other projects to Leonardo, using his special talents and abilities to devise a fantastic musical event, a festival that eventually came to be known as the Feast of Paradise. Turn it faster. Stay in time with the music. Listen to it. You up there, put some tallow on those gears. They squeak too much. They'll hear them up front. A magician. Oh, a magician. The Feast of Paradise was ordered by Lodovico to celebrate the marriage of his nephew, John Galeazzo, nominally the Duke of Milan, to Isabella of Aragon. The marriage was part of Lodovico's grand political design. At the time of the marriage, he evidenced no sign of usurping John's title for himself. But a few years later, the young man would be dead under highly suspicious circumstances, and Isabella would have little else but this night to hold among her happy memories of youth. Thank you, Duke. You should thank Lodovico, Isabella. Thank you, Uncle.
shoulders are under pressure now, Maestro. discussed with awe and admiration. The complete libretto of Bellinconi has survived to this day, but not the sketches of Leonardo. Therefore, what you have just seen is purely an imaginary reconstruction. We hope we've done justice to the maestro. In the summer of 1489, Lodovico put Leonardo to work on another time-consuming and trivial project decorating the walls and ceilings of Castello Sforzesco. Maestro Leonardo, a moment, please. I brought you this letter. Oh? I felt it was my duty as a Florentine to bring this letter to you. It's from the Moor to the Duke of Florence. And naturally, in my capacity as the ambassador from Florence, I must send it, but I want to read it to you first. I see. In this puzzling communique, Lodovico asked Lorenzo de' Medici to send him a master craftsman from Florence, one who would be able to complete the horse, since Leonardo's progress was too slow. The Moor did not mention himself as the cause of the delay. Some authorities feel that his real concern was that Leonardo's designs would be impossible to cast in bronze. Disregard for the media in which he worked was to be a lifelong trait of Leonardo's. At any rate, the letter came as a climax to a series of frustrations. Thank you, my friend. Marco. Marco. Yes, Maestro. We're stopping. Bring everything down from the scaffolding. All right. Milan. Well, Milan is not the only city. And the Sforza family are not the only rulers we have in Italy. My time's too valuable to paint these flowers and leaves. And design costumes for those childish spectacles of the Moor. Well, no more. Now I'll begin afresh painting. And not in Milan. We don't know who relented. Perhaps no other artist could really satisfy Lodovico. We do know that Leonardo modified his ideas, because the following spring he wrote, I have taken up the horse again. However, by order of Lodovico, Leonardo began devising another great pageant which kept the horse unfinished. A tournament was planned for the long-awaited marriage between Lodovico the Moor and his betrothed Beatrice d'Este. They look like barbarians of the Orient. Pelts, gold, shields encrusted with jewels. Well, now. Oh, yes. In the studio of Leonardo, a new pupil appeared. Salai. Nothing more. Then, just when everyone least expects it, the men will begin... Devil! Get out of here. Suddenly, they charge headlong into the audience Maestro. as though they're going to kidnap the ladies. Maestro. Oh, excuse me. We'll wait. Of course. It's really quite a good idea. <laughs> Donna Cecilia. What labor for a mere diversion that will be over in an hour. <laughs> At least you will see it. No, I came here to say goodbye to you. I suppose I've always known someday I'd have to go. Beatrice now has the more. He's making her his wife, so I can't remain here anymore. I'm going now. Since I'm without a vocation, I had to choose between matrimony or the convent. And it wasn't hard to select matrimony. Marchese Bergamini, do you know him? 
Festivals, pageants, carnivals. Why do you waste your great abilities, Maestro Leonardo? I know. What did I become? What happened to my life? Wasted. In January of 1491, Lodovico and Beatrice d'Este were married. His pride soon compelled him to banish his gentle mistress from Milan. Thus, the only woman who may have aroused any feelings of affection in Leonardo left his life forever. Get up there, let him see you. Just a minute, you. Go inside and get dressed and hurry. The tournament, which would celebrate the wedding, was entrusted to Leonardo by Galeazzo da San Severino, commander of the ducal troops. Leonardo, whose theories on war and weaponry had been ignored by Lodovico, threw himself into the pageant with the fervor of a general. His army was a mock horde of Tartars, dressed in gaudy and imaginative finery, and his objective was the fickle admiration of the court. The three-day tournament became as famous as the Feast of Paradise, and just as ephemeral. But more importantly, it deprived Leonardo of precious time he could have devoted to his real profession. No, no, you're putting them on all wrong. Pull them up, man, pull them up. How much longer do you need to get them on? Hurry up. I'll take that. I've told you not to leave these hats around. Here, this belongs to you. Put in the back room where it belongs. What are you doing? If it isn't tight, it'll fall off when you ride. Let us now consider the boy, Salai. And no one can tell us more than Leonardo himself. He wrote, on January 26th, I was in the house of Signor Galeazzo da San Severino, making preparations for the tournament. As I was fitting the grooms into their barbarian costumes, Iacomo, whom I have taken to calling Salai, entered one of the dressing rooms. I watched as he went to the clothes lying on the bed and extracted a purse belonging to one of the grooms. You do with no, my money. I didn't leave it Where'd you put it? I don't know what you're Tell talking me. about. I saw you. I saw you drop it. Where's the money? Let go. Little thief, let you were the only one in I here. I didn't take it. Where is it? I didn't take it. You better Tell me where my money is. Me. Stop it. Give the man his money, Sally. Money? I didn't take a thing. Ah, oh, you didn't take a thing. No, no. It's there. not a thing. You see? Thief. What did I tell you? I didn't take it. This is my it. money. He took it out no. of my purse. It's all a thief. Leonardo recorded night after night, as if intrigued by the boy's capacity for mischief. Item, an animal skin had been given to Leonardo as a gift. From it, he planned to fashion a pair of boots for himself. The skin was stolen. I know that it's Iacomo, but no proof. Salai? Aniseed. Confess, Salai. Me? About what? Oh, about all of the things that you've stolen. Huh? You took a skin this time. What happened to it? But, but I... Who did you sell it to? The shoemaker? No! My son Aniseed isn't free. You must have sold skin for them. How much? Maybe about... about... about 20 soldi. For 20 soldi? Three soldi was the price of a pair of shoes. Right. Twenty soldi probably bought the boy a mountain of aniseed. And so it went. After 1490, Leonardo's writings were filled with the exploits of the little ten-year-old. The second day he arrived, he stole four lire from the maestro's own purse. In the first year, Leonardo bought him a cloak for two lire, six shirts for four lire, a lined suit, five lire, and 24 pairs of shoes at six lire and five soldi. Twenty-four pair, two per month. It must have been a treat to see him sitting down. Let's examine this Giacomo. His father worked in Oreno, and the child's real name was Giacomo Caprotti. Leonardo nicknamed the boy Salai, the name of one of the devils in a poem by Luigi Pulci, Morgante Maggiore. When this little devil settled down into the house of Leonardo, it quickly became obvious the name was right. But what did Salai represent in the life of the artist? Someone who filled a deep need for affection? Someone to take the place of the children he never had? 
of the family that no longer existed? Perhaps the answer can be found in Leonardo's biographer, Giorgio Vasari, writing 50 years after his subject's death. What does he tell us of the creature the maestro continually called thieving, lying, obstinate, riotous, and sinful? The boy was totally without beauty in the simple graces, says Vasari. And still Leonardo taught him much about art. <laughs> Sally was more concerned with gold than art. Why can't you be still? Because I itch. Scratch that. <sighs> Milan finally beheld Leonardo's model of the horse honoring Francesco Sforza. It was placed on public view in 1493. Actually, no one knows what it was like. There are only a few sketches of Leonardo's and none of those are really finished. Today, a private collector in Florence owns a wax model of particular beauty. This model may possibly be the one Vasari mentions. As for the giant model in the square, time and invading armies have destroyed it. From this moment on, the books of Leonardo are filled with notes concerning the casting of the Colossus. That's ready for the fire. The great Florentine architect, San Gallo, and the famous mathematician, Fra Luca Pacioli, came to visit him in his workshop. 200,000 pounds, maestro? Nobody in the world has ever attempted this. I've been looking at your drawings. Such crucibles do not exist. Perhaps you should also look at this furnace, then. I designed it myself. It's a mystery to me. What's it mean? What is all this paraphernalia? As usual, Leonardo's research produced its side effects. He casually invented the dual chamber. However, it was buried in his notes, and many years would have passed before it was invented again. Uh, it's not the furnaces that are worrying me, it's the bronze. 200,000 pounds isn't enough? Oh, it's the Moor. He's using bronze to make cannons. For years, Lodovico Sforza had held the powers of state. Now he had assumed the title as well. His nephew, John Galeazzo, was dead. Poisoned, it was rumored, by his ambitious and ruthless uncle. Once the title was his, Lodovico also took on a ruler's constant companions, fear and anguish. Fortify. Yes, yes. Fortify. Fortify Vigivano, Novara. Fortify Pavia. Fortify. French were gathering at the border, contesting the Moors' right to the title. The new Duke continued to strengthen his defenses, fearful of losing all that he had struggled so hard to gain. But the coffers were empty. The bronze, which had been set aside for Leonardo, was sent to Ferrara to be turned into cannon. The great horse would never become a reality. Today, Caterina arrived. That entry was made in his daily journal on July 16th, 1493. And he repeated the date twice. This repetition of the date has puzzled historians for centuries and deepened one of the greatest mysteries in Leonardo's life. All we can be sure of is the name and the existence of Caterina. Writing of his father's death, he had repeated the time twice, seven o'clock. Could this be an unconscious connection between the departure of a father and the arrival of a mother? We infer from his wording that this Caterina was not a servant. Does it imply that she was the same humble peasant who bore him out of wedlock? If so, why does he not write, my mother, instead of Caterina? Caterina? Let's try it this way. Whenever he talked to her in public, he would always call her Katerina. Katerina, look! Mm. This is him! We can only speculate on their relationship in private. There are other references to Katerina. A notebook devoted to the amount he spent on housekeeping expenses that year has an entry that reads, Thursday, 29th of January, 1494. Gave this day to Caterina. Ten soldi. But then there's another. 
it is a surprising and unexpected entry found amid the records of his ordinary accounts. Paid toward the burial of Katerina is all it says. Of all the phrases he might have used, why did he choose such blunt, unfeeling words? Was he ending forever the secret relationship that began many years ago in the little town of Vinci, when, as a child, he first saw his mother smile at him from the door of her home? Three pounds of wax, 27 lire. The wax was for the torches. Funerals took place in the early evening. When he first came to Milan, he had written, as the evening falls, look at the faces of the men and women and see what grace and softness you find there. Four priests and four acolytes, two soldi. It was not a luxurious funeral, but neither could it be called a poor one. For the Paul and Paul bearers, 16 soldi. The dead were not carried to their rest in closed coffins. Bell, book, sponge, two soldi. The bell tolled as the body was carried to the burial ground. And then, the final expense. Grave diggers, 16 soldi. Katerina's name was never mentioned again.